Democracy That Delivers is brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. And now to your host, Ken Jakes. Hi, everyone. This is Ken Jakes. I'm the host of Democracy That Delivers, our weekly podcast here at Site. And I'm joined once again. I, actually, we probably should just rename the show the, the, the Barb and Marie and, and Ken show because I have you guys in here so much. But we have uh, Marie uh, uh, Principe. I, do I, did I get that yeah, right? Yeah, you got it right. Finally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she is a program officer for MENA and uh, kind of the director of the Life Project here or something kind of like that. I'll, I'll get them to change my title. Well, we should. <laughs> That's not a bad idea, is it? And then Barb. Barb Langley, of course, uh, she's a frequent uh, co-host uh, of ours here at uh, Democracy That Delivers, but she is the director for the Center uh, for Women's Economic Empowerment, which is a new program here, as everybody knows. Barb, thank you so much for coming back. Thank you so much for having me again. Um, and I confess, you know, we we started this off with Women's History Month. Um, That's right. And I said, Ken, let me take over the, the, the airways for the month of March, and we're just going to continue. Continue it into April. <laughs> exactly. Of course, by the time this goes up, because we have so many in the can, it could be July or August. Before That's all right. We'll get you we'll one at least once a month, maybe. <laughs> we'll keep it going. The future is female. That's right. <laughs> That's a beautiful segue, because we're talking about women in the life project today. So but before we get started, I... Let's let's kind of get people up to date on what the Life Project is. We probably have some new listeners that they don't even know what the Life Project is. So, Marie, you want to step in real quick and sure, talk yeah. About it? Okay. So, quick quick reminder for folks um, or a snapshot of it is the Life Project stands for Livelihoods Innovation Through Food Entrepreneurship, and it's uh, it's an innovative approach that that we've designed with a consortium of organizations um, to respond to the humanitarian challenge of the wave of Syrian refugees that. Uh, came into Turkey after the after the war in Syria. Um, we've established two food incubators, one in Istanbul, and we have one under construction in Mersin right now in the south. And the purpose of the project and of the incubators is to provide entrepreneurship training um, for individuals in the food sector. And we offer business support services. And we also um, interweave the concept of gastrodiplomacy or building social cohesion through food over out, throughout. So we're working with um, individuals that want to start food businesses, both Syrians and Turks and people from Yemen, Iraq, a whole host of other countries. And this is a wonderful model, and hopefully we can replicate this in other places in the world in the, in the near future, because it's been a just an astounding success, and we're going to get into that in just a little bit. But we want to talk today about women and the LIFE program, but we want to make it very clear on the on, uh, outset that this is not a women's project. This is, this is for both men and women. It's all-inclusive. It uh, has really helped, and we're going to get into that. Uh, a lot of individuals, a lot of families, a lot of businesses uh, f- from from both sexes, and uh, but it does have an impact on women. That's what we want to talk about today. So I want to turn that over to you right now, uh, Marie, and let, let's talk about that. Sure. Well, I think I mean there are a lot of a lot of different ways that the project has benefited women. I think it's important to mention first that statistically, women. Um, uh, are disproportionately impacted by conflict. There, there tends to be a multiplier effect with women, um, where the there's a trickle down effect. When something negative happens to a woman, it also filters down to her family, to um, you know her ability to to be a role model to her kids. Kids are not able to go to school. They're not able to be you know fed well and all of that. If the if the family doesn't have an and then the primary caretaker raising children. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Which also means that they're not um, you know they're not able if they're if in a conflict setting or post conflict setting, they're usually the first time heads of household and right. there aren't, there are often not as many um, opportunities for women or there are barriers that keep women from being able to enter the economic, political or social space in the same way that, that men can. So I think that's important to highlight. So we're, we're already sort of dealing with that, um, challenge when we're when we're responding uh, or when we're building the life project and serving our, our non-Turkish members. Um, and I think, you know, aside from, aside from helping people, People start businesses, which which has benefits for men and women. One of the one of the biggest things that I've seen is that it's it's become a great community center for for the women who are in the project, and it's also been an opportunity for them to build confidence in themselves um, as entrepreneurs, as individuals. 
oftentimes, uh, you know, they've never worked before joining the Life Project, um, and they've they've also not done a lot of public speaking. And we we require our members to do to participate in the business pitch competition. And so, at the end of their four month training, they actually have to stand up in front of people and give a three to five minute pitch about their business. And we do quite a bit of coaching before they do this. Um, but you can see for for a lot of the women who've never done this before, they're when they first come into the program, sometimes they're, you know, they're shy. They're a bit more timid. They're not as comfortable to 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 speak about themselves. Or, I mean, women generally have have more difficulty talking um, with confidence about what it is that they've accomplished and what it is they can. Bring Do you to the see table. that as a universal thing? Uh, mm -hmm. Because you know you notice it here, but is it all over the world? Uh, from your experience, that's yeah. I mean, I think from from what I've seen, both in the women's political leadership programs that I've done and women's economic empowerment, you see that everywhere in all sectors. Um, uh, and, you know, even here, you know, in, in the West, you know, where we have, yeah. you know, a lot of opportunity well, Barbara, and privilege. Well, you and I talked about that. We, we have, we training, exactly, yeah. exactly. You know, I think women, um, I, I'm not sure exactly why, but, you know, when we uh, are, are getting our start and, 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 and trying to get started, basically, we feel like we need to have the background, the education, the networks, that we have to line everything up just perfectly before we can act and do. Right. And whereas men, you know, more typically, yeah. I want to say, just wing it. And they just kind of go with the flow yeah. and, and they learn by doing in a lot of ways. So, right. you know, trying to... to, to to empower women to to feel confident, and honestly, to be not afraid to fail is 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 really right. important. Well, I think that's an important point because in a lot of places we work in, and I'm assuming it's probably the same in the refugee populations there, but traditionally and culturally, uh, women haven't really been allowed to take be in the forefront mm -hmm. as much mm -hmm. uh, as we're used to here in the United States or the West. Uh, right. And so this program is kind of transformative in, in a lot of ways. And it by, by giving women confidence in coming forward, you know, by word of mouth, by talking to other women, you probably see a cumulative effect, too. Mm -hmm. You probably see more and more women hearing about things like this. So it has a transformative effect just beyond you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the entrepreneurs and what you're training mm -hmm. here, but it has an overall positive uh, uh, setting, I guess, or right. or, or, or impact on, right. on the culture at large. And we've talked about that before. I mean, you know, by and large, um, SIPES programs all over the world in the past, we, we focus a lot on um, how we can build capacity in, right. in business associations, chambers of commerce, how those uh, networks then can impact the enabling environment and, exactly. and change le legislation and, and the regulatory environment. But when it comes to working with women um, in these projects, one of the things that we are are looking into now is the soft skills, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, the change in perception of women's leadership in society through the, the work that they've done and how they've impacted the economy um, and how... Um, uh, how they view themselves and how their confidence builds. And I know Marie and I have actually talked a lot about um, um, different women that have come through her program. Um, and I remember, for example, maybe she can tell us a little bit about it more about um, a husband and wife, actually, mm -hmm. that, that came through the program and how that not only impacted um, their pockets, which is what the project is designed to do, but you know they've they've confided in us and talked a little bit about their marriage and and other things. Do you want to maybe share a little bit? Yeah, sure. And I think if if I can go back to what you're mentioning mm -hmm. before, another thing that I think is important about the Life Project, and you know, generally I'm not a big fan of women only programs um, because I think there's just a there's a lot that men can learn as well, um, and and you know there's a lot that women can learn from men. And so you just kind of bring everyone together. I mean, if you, sometimes if you, there are certain times and places where I think that's appropriate, but sometimes if you, if you create a, a problem, then it becomes a problem, right? There might not be a problem anyway. So we've made certain accommodations in order for women to participate. Um, you know, we have a daycare facility so that women can bring their children, which is a, otherwise would be, um, would be a challenge for them. But I think, um, you know, to the husband and wife couple, we the 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 wife um, was a member of our first cohort in Istanbul, and then her uh, she wanted to start a falafel business. She got really motivated and and is still very much engaged with the project and um, has been generating revenue um, since joining about a year ago. And her husband was inspired to join a couple of months later, so he joined the third cohort in Istanbul. And we talked to them uh, after after they had both gone through the project, and the husband confided in us that when they 
you know, when they used to come home, he would come home from work and they'd sit around the dinner table and they would normally talk about, you know, what's going on with the kids and who needs help and what kind of subject and who's going to shuttle who to what, you know, music lessons or whatever it was. He said, our marriage has changed that when we sit around the dinner table, we talk about our business ideas and we talk about who's going to do what. And, and he said that their, their partnership, their marriage had become more of a partnership because they were becoming business partners. And so I think that that is one, the important reason to engage men in, in projects like this, because there, there are benefits for, for all of us as human beings to collectively learn how to, how to work together. Um, and I also don't think, you know, often we think about it, it's like a zero sum game in our head, right? We're like, if you if you create more space for women to do certain things, that takes away space from men to be able to do things. And people get really defensive about who belongs in what scenario. And we're not talking about challenging gender roles. You know, we're not trying to to take away the the role of women as caregivers. But we're saying that in addition to doing that, she can she can also add value to the family by bringing in revenue. And there are certain skill sets that that a woman might may already have or that, you know, that she can bring to the table. And then that benefits the family overall. And it creates a partnership where men and women are learning from each other while still respecting whatever gender roles right. they they determine is best for their for themselves. You know, Marie, you bring up a, a point that I've been trying to make for years and years because uh, I've been in the the development business for a long time before I started here at Saip, I had a public relations firm, mostly in Eastern Europe. But the thing that I, I just stood out to me immediately is people are people. It doesn't matter where, what continent you're from, where you're from. But the story that you just told could be the exact same story that a, an American family could be talking about or someone in Africa or South America. And there's a lot of myths about refugee populations. And I, I noticed a statistic in the, in the stuff that you guys gave me before, but that 95% of the Syrian refugees in Turkey live outside of camps. And there's this perception that everyone's living in camps, and that's just not the case at all. You know, they're, they're, they're just people coming from a very difficult environment and trying to, to make a better life for mm -hmm. themselves. And, and that's the true that, for the ones in the camps as well. <laughs> a, a, absolutely. <laughs> you know? That 5%. Yeah. Absolutely. But the story you just told is any American family could be, be talking about the exact mm -hmm. same thing. And this is why this is, I think, so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a there's a universal truth. And Barb and I were talking about this earlier that I just returned from Turkey last week. And um, one thing I noticed, I was in Mersin, or actually when we were in Mersin, we spent a couple of days in Tarsus, which is a wonderfully beautiful historic city where St. Paul is from. And so there's a lot of religious, you know, significance to it. So in any case, we were walking around one of the mosques and I noticed that the the women that I was passing they would they would look the other you know I was with a large group of people about mm -hmm. nine or ten people and they only looked at the other women and they would smile and nod and there was this very nice acknowledgement that and I've seen this a lot in in my travels especially in the Middle East um, but I'm sure it happens elsewhere where there's there's something about like women it seems like tend to connect with other women just at that level before right. you even get to language or religion or nationality or anything else I feel like I can connect with another woman as a woman right. before anything, because there are some right. universal truths to our experience and that creates a space, I think mm -hmm. for, 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 I don't, I don't know. I mean, yeah. Barb and I just well, chatted Barb, about yeah. this. We it's, were just talking mm -hmm, about yeah. that before mm -hmm. and Barb, uh, this is a perfect segue to mm -hmm. what we were going to talk about anyway. Sure. What that many of these women, and, and this is based on your, your experience over there, they start bonding each with each other as women before right. they even start talking about the project itself. Right. So, Right, and I think um, I think that's actually an argument for women only program in a way too. I, I mean, I share I share Marie's um, uh, insight and agreement that we do need to engage men and we do need to involve men and women equally in programs, but there is value to creating space where women can connect and network just as women. Why is that so important? And speaking as a non female. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a learning experience for me. Right, right. I think because it's a safe space. Um, you know, it goes back to this confidence issue that we've talked mm -hmm. about in the past. And one of the things that I've noticed in the programs that I've done, um, you know, in again, in women's political empowerment and women's economic empowerment is when you get a group of women together, there's this positivity, there's this energy, and there's this can-do spirit where you present them with a problem or you present them with a learning task and they take it on, you know, full speed. And it's a spirit that they're going to get it done and they're going to, um, you know, just uh, 
change the world with this, right? Um, and it's the the support that they get from the the other women in the room, the friends that they make, the networks that they make, um, uh, you know, things of that nature. Whereas when I find um, a mixed group. Um, that I've worked with in a training setting or in a consultation setting on whatever the topic is, and you present them with a problem, and you know the first half an hour is dealing with, well, that's not going to work here. We're very unique. You know, it, it, the the situation is, is our own. Do you think that's nature or nurture or a combination of the two? And the reason I say that mm-hmm. is being a father of a daughter, mm-hmm. and she's she's young, she's ten years old. Mm-hmm. But one thing I've noticed, I grew up with only boys in, right. in the family. We didn't, there, there wasn't any girls in the family. And one thing we notice with our daughter and, and other other little girls is they do exactly what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. They work really, really well in groups. And, and then the boys are out doing their own thing. They're disorganized and things like that. So is it something innate in in women uh, and mm-hmm. young girls? Or is it something that's taught? Is it something that's learned? Uh because it seems like a universal thing. I feel like I could do a whole academic research project. On exactly, this, <laughs> but it's very interesting. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, I'm I'm not exactly sure sure what the what the deal is. Um, you know, I feel like there there is something in in terms of the the way that we're built mm-hmm. um, as men and women, um, different strengths and weaknesses that we have, and um, being communication skills. Maybe. Yeah, and and being introspective enough to understand what your strengths and weaknesses are, and humble enough to um, know what others bring to the table. And mm-hmm. I think that women have kind of an intuition, mm-hmm. um, genuinely, when it comes to this. Um, Can I add to yes, that, too? Please, I think yes. that, I think also, I mean, since basically the dawn of time, for whatever reason, it's been, deter- it, it has been determined by the powers that be, whatever those powers are, that men and women serve certain purposes and mm-hmm. fill certain roles. And that's, for the most part, carried on to be true, you know, generation all over the generation, world through generation, yeah. right? And, you know, it served needs at different times when you had hunter-gatherers mm-hmm. and then things have evolved. So I think that there's been a, a whole lot of socialization mm-hmm. around women being more community-oriented right. and being more, you know, intuitive and, and, mm-hmm. and emotional or, you know, whatever kind of words we want to tack on what it means to be woman. Um, and, I, th- you know, that's it's a it's hotly debated all over and oh, it you is. know yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and I wouldn't even brought it up but I just noticed I, yeah. I guess like I'm an amateur sociologist <laughs> but just watching you know my daughter and her little friends mm-hmm. but they do the, exactly what you're what you're describing right. you know mm-hmm. halfway around the world and I sort of feel like I mean whatever the reason of it is like let's let's capitalize exactly. on that That's, I mean that was if, my I'm, next point. if I'm if I if Take I am better at you know b- being more aware of emotions and, and community right. yeah. oriented or and all that coalition building you know exactly that's kind of for what whatever this reason is. let's play to our strengths yeah and. Well, and I, you know, I'm reminded actually of another conversation that you and I had, Marie, um, early on in the program. Um, and, and we it, could learn from it too. I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah, men could learn from that as well. For sure. Yeah. And it, it kind of speaks to this, um, you know, whether it's a, a, a natural inclination for networking or what it is. Mm-hmm. But I remember Marie telling me about um, a woman in the program that had a specific product that just wouldn't sell basically in the community where she was um, because there was no market for it. Um, but being connected to this program and being connected to other men and women in the program, she was able to solve the problem basically and make a connection to a transportation company and to another company across town that enabled her to, to, to get that, that product out. And I'm sure that you probably have a bunch of other stories. Um, very similar, very to, that, similar yeah. to that. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that we've been encouraged by our, um, one of our partners is union kitchen, which we've had on right. the podcast before. Give, a, give them a plug. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. They're, they're a great partner and, and, uh, sort of, they're considered the gold standard in food incubators. And, and one, again, what is Union uh, Kitchen again for our listeners? Uh, so they build successful food businesses. Uh, it's a shared commercial kitchen space. And they're here in Washington, D.C. They're D. in Washington, D.C. Um, and and they are helping us. Really, the Life Project, the incubators that we're building in, in Turkey are modeled after Union Kitchen. And one thing that they continue to encourage us to... to um, inculcate within our within our training team over over in Turkey is that the members need to be and all entrepreneurs need to be flexible and and willing to pivot when they learn that something isn't working in the market and I think especially in the region there's a lot of sensitivity around um, failure and whether you can talk about failure and and you know in the entrepreneurship community it's 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 encouraged you talk about how many times you failed because you learn from every time that you fail but that's been a challenge for for men and women in the program to to talk about what their you know what their failures are and how they can learn from it so i think 
again, there's this benefit of having men and women there together because maybe if one of them is more comfortable talking about it, then the other one can can learn from that as well, regardless of the gender dynamics there. Can I put you on the spot? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Do you have an example? I'm curious. Um, you know, have you seen any of the women in your project pivot like that, like you just described, um, where um, something wasn't quite going quite right, and and they were able to work through the the life project basically to to amend and correct that problem. I have an example of one that worked and one that didn't work. Excellent. <laughs> so <laughs> learning from failure is always good. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if she feels that way. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> but um, one of our members who I who I won't mention, um, and I also won't give the product information because yeah. that that would probably give her away too. But she but she had a product that she wanted to develop, um, and the machinery was too expensive to mm-hmm. in order to create this product, and it was more than she could afford. Her kids were already supporting her, and so she she just didn't have the means to do that. And we we tried to encourage her to think about a different product, one that would generate revenue, one that would respond to the market, you know, all of that. And she either wasn't able or wasn't willing to to do that and is still sort of holding out hope that she's going to be able to to do the thing that she originally set her mind on, which is which is unfortunate because that means that she's not making money, you know, right. at least through that right. means. She might she might be doing something else, but right. um so I think that's that's one example. The other one, which I think is the one that you were alluding to, is we have a member from our first cohort who was making um, was inspired by um, you know the cupcake you know fa- yeah. um, you know wave that happened um, I think in the, in the U.S. and probably right. elsewhere about how cupcakes are so exciting um, and and makes these beautiful cakes. I mean, she makes a whole bunch of different desserts, but but they're really phenomenally designed. Um, but cupcakes are just not as popular in, in Turkey as they, I mean, even here, they're sort of, you know, cupcakes aren't that, it's like a bee dessert, you know? Yeah, People or like, birthday yeah. parties or something. Yeah, like that. exactly. Yeah, it's yeah. for very specific occasions. So she's pivoting and she's trying different products and where she's selling her product now in a local coffee shop, um, the, the owner of that coffee shop is, is letting her basically test uh, products in the market. And so she'll come out, you know, every once in a while, she'll keep her cupcakes in for sale. But then she also tries a few other things. And she's trying to gauge what are going to be the most desirable to the, to the market. And so I think that that's, you know, and she's learning by doing. And that's, that's really right. for all of us, for sure. you know, what you have to end up doing in the end. Right, right, sure. for sure. Marie, the, the project's been going on now for about a year and a half, right? I think we did the launch in, was it September or October? Mm, of September. September of, mm-hmm. 20, 2017. 2017, so it's been yeah. a long time. Yeah. Give us an update on what's going on. There's a lot of, of really exciting stuff happening. Um, as I said, we just came back um, from a trip recently, and we just had our first business pitch competition for the Marison cohort. Um, so we have, even though the Marison um, Food Enterprise Center, or the which we call is what we call our incubators, has been under construction, um, which is moving along very quickly. We we didn't want to hold off on making sure that we could still um, serve the population there, and so we went ahead and continued on with our entrepreneur training there. Um, and so the first cohort of entrepreneurs graduated. Uh, so that was very exciting. Um, and then we also had our first demo day in Istanbul, which is another idea that was inspired by Union Kitchen. Um, so it was for all of the members, but it was, I think, mostly members from the third and fourth cohorts who participated. Um, so they were at our food incubator. They all set up the people who wanted to participate. They set up booths. They had samples of their product. They had information about their product. And we invited a whole f- host of folks from the community. The U.S. consulate was there, um, business owners, um, Turkish and Syrian from Istanbul and the surrounding areas uh, came and walked around to each of the individual entrepreneurs booths one by one. And, you know, you could see it was really it was a really phenomenal experience, I think, for, for a lot of reasons. I mean, one, it really helped the members build their network, their customer base, you know, potential partners. That's really the purpose of this project is to help get them access to market and generating revenue. So Demo Day was 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 critical for that. I think also it sort of developed some healthy competition between the members as well. You know, you could see the members who had really well-designed flyers and, and business cards mm-hmm. and their food was, was placed in these perfect little sample cups so it was easy to carry. And then there were the other members who wrote their name on a piece of paper and just like stuck the, you know, folded the piece of paper and, and put it up and they'd give you a chicken wing and you had to figure out how to walk around the room and try other food holding a chicken wing. I mean, yeah. and you could see that they were kind of looking at each other and I got a couple points. We heard members say, well, why didn't someone so-and-so come to my table? And, and it was a great opportunity to say, you're right. 
why didn't they come to your table? It's a learning experience. Yeah, yeah. take, you know, this, it's, and I think that's the other, the great thing about the Life Project too, is that it encourages people to have a sense of their own agency. Like mm -hmm. you are, you as an entrepreneur have to own this. You yeah. have to be, you have it's to know to why it's working and know why it's not working. It yeah. creates competition, right? Yeah, yeah. and that's, that's yeah. one of the, one of the mm -hmm. points of this whole mm -hmm. thing. How many yeah. people have gone through the program now? Uh, over a hundred, wow. over a hundred. How now. many of those are women? Uh, probably about 50 to 60%. Okay. okay. So yeah. a little more than half. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a nice, a nice 50, 50 yes. um, happening. Which kind of gets back to our original point is right. this is for everybody. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and where does the life project go from now? I know you've talked about a cookbook for a long time. Yep. We yeah. have the cookbook. It's, um, it's just about done. So okay. we've been really fortunate. The, um, the leading culinary Institute of, of Turkey has, um, picked up the cookbook um, oh, good. and tested all of the recipes. They've gone back and forth with the members. They even did the photography of all of the recipes, um, which was, was really phenomenal, um, for us to, to have that credibility of, of MSA is, is the acronym for it. Um, and so when we were there, they were finishing up some of the photography of the recipes. And so the recipes are done and we're reviewing everything now and we're getting bids for publication. Oh, terrific. Um, so hopefully you know, it's still in process. It turns trying out to get a U.S. based uh, publisher for it or probably not this year. This okay. year we're going to publish in Turkey in Just both in Turkey, Turkish okay. and Arabic. Okay. Um, but hopefully if we, if we do receive funding for the project for the next two years, then we'll aim to publish it in the U.S. Which I'd buy one. Uh, yeah, it sounds really interesting. <laughs> We're going to try to get some swag, too. I think yeah, absolutely. We, we, if you might oh, yeah, see in some of, of the pictures, we have Life Project aprons. Right. And yeah. I've been telling our partner in Turkey that I want to buy... The cooking hats yeah. and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know. Like a lot of fun. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Which is a perfect segue into the next segment. This is where we jump in our time machine and we go five years from now. And I know we asked this, so it probably gets redundant at this point. But where are we going to be five years from now with this project? With, with the project? Yeah. And then I'm going to ask... Uh, <laughs> Barb, where are we going to be with uh, with your program in five years? Well, and it might even be, you know, what what is uh, where do you see women in the project in five years too? Because I know yeah, you've probably been asked that question a couple mm -hmm. times now for for life yeah. projects. So yeah, I think I would like to see, um, and I think we're on track with this. Having and this is true for the men as well, but since we're talking about women, sure. um, I would like to see our our women members um, having. A sustainable livelihood, having revenue, you know, generating revenue, having money in their pockets that they can provide for their families. I'd like them to be able to make enough money that they can have money for savings. They can absorb shocks to the economy. Turkish mm -hmm. economy is in flux, you know, right now. I, it's it's not an easy time to be starting a business in Turkey, no matter where you're from. Um, and and making sure that people are are um, in a position where they're financially stable and resilient is is important to to us. Um, I think also employing other people and creating jobs for others is, is, is important. One of our members from the um, second cohort um, who came in with, in the project with sort of an idea but, but not really sure what she wanted to do, she honed in on this idea while she was in the project um, and now has built a catering business and she's hired – she's Syrian and she's hired another Syrian and a Turk – um, to support her and and she's also looking to hire other people and she's asking members within the life project if if they want to work for her as well so you know that kind of networking is 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 I think a, a sign of success and her creating livelihoods creating jobs you know for other people um, and and for members of the host community is also um, a huge success so I'd like to see more of that happening um, and and that and that multiplying over the next five years. Yeah. Barb, last mm -hmm. word with you. I would love to see um, site learn from these best practices and how it's impacted women in particular, not just by getting money in their pockets, but also how it's changed their lives, their marriages, the, the perception of their leadership in their community and their business sector. Um, you know, so doing a bit more thoughtful uh, information gathering in terms of you know, the real impact of, of SIPES programs and, and not just those that are readily apparent um, mm -hmm. in legislative or regulatory change right. or, you know, money in the pocket, things like that. But then I would like to see that also replicated in other countries. Mm -hmm. I know we were talking about it, you know, perhaps for Colombia, um, and there might be some avenue that we can explore um, adapting some of the, the lessons that we've learned through the Life Project for our Women's Business Resource Centers um, right. as we create those elsewhere. Um so, you know, just taking lessons learned and applying them and, yep. and helping to have more stories like what Marie's telling us yep. about the, the women that come through her program. Well, thank you both for coming. Uh, it was a pleasure as usual. And 30 minutes just flew by, as they always do. 
So thanks again, and I'm sure we'll have both of you back in very soon. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, we'll Ken. see everybody next week. Bye. You've been listening to Democracy That Delivers. For more information about the Center for International Private Enterprise, please go to our website at sipe.org. That's C-I-P-E dot org. Thanks for listening.